the Laplace transform of a function little f of t is just a definite integral with respect to t of the function multiplied by a negative exponential. The exponential contains a factor negative s as well as t. Given a function f of t, we would hope in principle to be able to do the anti-differentiation and evaluate the answer between the two integration limits. Once we've done that, t will have been substituted for and will no longer be present. On the other hand, s will still be present. The answer will be a function of s. To indicate that, we choose a name for the Laplace transform showing that it depends on s. If the function in the integral is little f of t, we would normally refer to the transform as capital F of s. If the function in the integral has a different name such as g, then we would choose capital G, and so on. Another notation you will sometimes see for a Laplace transform involves the letter curly L, taken from the script alphabet. When we use this letter, we normally use its argument to be little f of t, to remind us that the function was called f of t. Although the argument is f of t, it's taken as understood that the script L of f of t is itself still a function of s. Faced with an integral such as that on the right, there are a number of questions that we can and should ask before progressing. One of the first, actually, is why do we bother to make such a fuss of it? Why do we give it a special name? Well, there are a number of good reasons, but some of them will not become clear until you've had a chance to use the Laplace transform and see it in action, see what it can do for us. One reason, though, is quite simple. Integrals of this kind for various f of t's crop up quite often in science and engineering. If someone in the past has taken the trouble to evaluate them and make tables, then we should be quite happy about that because we can just look up the answer without doing the work. In an introductory course, most of the integrals you meet for Laplace transforms will not be that difficult. They'll involve standard techniques such as substitution or integration by parts. But even integration by parts can get very tedious, as you'll quickly find out if you try and evaluate the following integral. Evaluating this integral would take six integration by parts consecutively. It would take quite a long time. On the other hand, I can look up the Laplace transform of t to the sixth, substitute s equal to 1, and immediately get an answer. It happens to be 720. Integration by parts may be rather tedious, but it is still a relatively elementary method. Sometimes, though, we meet functions in the Laplace transform for which the integration technique is by no means elementary. It can involve, for example, following complicated paths in the complex plane to get an answer. Even experienced mathematicians can sometimes get rusty at doing that sort of thing if they don't do it often. So it is certainly very convenient to be able to look up in tables of integrals the values of Laplace transforms for whatever function you may need. What really makes a Laplace transform special, though, is its ability to turn a differential equation into an algebraic equation, thus eliminating the necessity to do complicated integrals in order to solve the differential equation. The reason that works is connected with the special property of the exponential function, that is, that it is its own derivative. We don't have time in this screencast to investigate that. Instead, I want to focus a little bit more on the integral and talk about some basic things in connection with the Laplace transform. First of all, there's that infinity symbol. Infinity is not a number, so what on earth does it mean to put an infinity on the top of the integral? We can't actually substitute it as though it was a number. Well, almost always when you see the symbol infinity, it's understood that there is the idea of a limit lurking in the background. When you see infinity on the top of an integral, it means we're allowing the top limit to be very large and letting it get bigger and bigger. Thus, when we write the integral from zero to infinity of a function, we mean to take the limit as n goes infinity, with the top limit on the integral being a capital N. Understanding that should lead us to another question. It needs to be meaningful to actually take the limit of the integrand once you've anti-differentiated it. That's one good reason for having a negative exponential in the integrand. 
negative exponentials tend to go to zero very quickly as their argument gets big. A negative exponential can kill off the effect of a function even if the function itself is getting large the negative exponential often goes to zero much quicker. There are some well-known limits of this kind. For example any polynomial multiplied by a negative exponential goes to zero as the variable goes to infinity. The powers of x might get very big but the exponential kills them off much quicker than they can grow. This property means that it will be meaningful for us to take the Laplace transform of any polynomial. Sine and cosine are some further examples. A sine or a cos never gets bigger than 1 in magnitude. Multiplying it by a negative exponential will quickly kill it off. Here I've allowed the sine or the cos to depend on ax where a is any constant. This limit being 0 means that it will be meaningful to take Laplace transforms for sine and cosine. Let's now have a brief look at how some of this works in practice. Once we do that we will start to understand better the variable s. I'd like to look at the Laplace transform of the simple function f of t equals t. Here it is. We can perform the integral by integration by parts. I'm not going to go through the details but just write out the answer. Let's suffice to say that you can choose u equal to t and dv by dt to be the exponential. I've written the answer on the next page before substitution of the limits. Here it is. Notice we have a factor e to the negative st. Inside the brackets there's a polynomial in t. We can regard the s's as just constants so far as t is concerned. When we try to substitute the infinite limit we have to think of that limit being n where n gets bigger and bigger. We know that so long as that really is a negative exponential that even multiplied by t it will still disappear as t gets very big. To be a negative exponential that means that we really need s to be positive. That's an important restriction on the Laplace transform that we haven't mentioned up to now. We must have s greater than zero. If s was a negative quantity then we would start to get a positive exponential getting bigger and bigger as the upper limit goes towards infinity. In that case the Laplace transform would not be well defined. OK, well let's assume that s is positive. In that case putting the upper limit in kills off everything. It leaves us just with the zero to substitute. Substituting t equals zero would also kill off the first term there will be an extra negative sign because we're substituting a bottom limit and so finally our answer will be positive 1 over s squared e to the 0 and of course e to the 0 is 1 so we have the result 1 over s squared. The Laplace transform of t is 1 over s squared so long as s is positive that is an important addition to the definition of the Laplace transform that we must always keep in mind. We have to be a little bit careful with this restriction because sometimes it can change. I'd like to demonstrate that by doing one more example. I want now to look at the Laplace transform of the function e to the power a t where a is a positive constant. Here it is. It's actually easier to integrate than the last example. All we've got to do is combine those two powers in the exponential and then just anti-differentiate an exponential. Here's what we get. The powers in the exponential com combine to make a minus s times t and that's easy to anti-differentiate simply by dividing by a minus s. We're now required to put in the limits. Substituting zero will be no problem but what about that infinity? If t gets very big we must ensure that its coefficient is negative otherwise the exponential will blow up. That means that now we need a minus s to be negative. If a minus s is negative another way of saying that would be s is greater than a. If a is a positive constant that's a restriction on the Laplace transform a little bit different to the one we had before. It's peculiar to having an exponential 
as our f of t. Nevertheless, it is something that we must remember. The Laplace transform, for example, of e to the 2t is well-defined only for s greater than 2, and so on.